Welcome to the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas talk series. Um, firstly, I, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Greg Lehman. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Aboriginal Leadership here at the University. I'm also a descendant of the Trollway people of northeastern Tasmania, and um, I'd like you, I'd like to welcome you um, to the country of the Muanina people. Um, uh, they called this place Nipaluna. Um, and this island was known as La Truita, uh, a place we now know and love as Tasmania. The Aboriginal community uh, of Tasmania today uh, continues the, the custodial responsibilities for country that were once uh, carried by the Moanina, who unfortunately um, didn't survive uh, the impact of British invasion. We don't know of any, um, any descendants of the Moanina today. So I'd, um, I'd just like to, um, like to acknowledge their passing, but also acknowledge the, uh, the important role of, um, of elders and the role that um, elders have played um, for this community in, in Tasmania and, um, and continue to play. So on behalf of the University of Tasmania, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's Island of Ideas public talk, Resurrecting Our Native Icons. As residents of Tasmania, many of us are deeply connected to the land and the animals um, that also call this place home. For our online viewers, you perhaps haven't had the fortune of visiting Tasmania and may not be familiar with the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, um, a large carnivorous marsupial uh, that you may be surprised to learn was native to both the island of Tasmania and to uh, the mainland or continent of Australia. The Tasmanian emu, on the other hand, uh, is considered to be to be a, have been a subspecies of the mainland emu um, and was unique to Tasmania and persisted alongside of Aboriginal people, coexisted with Aboriginal people uh, on this island for uh, for the last 20,000 years and, um, and lived on what I like to call the Great Southern Peninsula of the continent uh, during the last ice age when Tasmania was, was connected to the mainland. Both the thylacine and the emu were hunted to extinction uh, following European arrival. Tonight we'll be discussing the idea of reintroduction of these species to Tasmania. Our speakers will provide us with, a, with unique perspectives on this topic and I hope a comprehensive framework for understanding the potential benefits and problems that reintroduction might bring, not to mention the challenges in relation to the thylacine. The conversation will challenge us to think critically about our custodianship, our relationship with the environment and the role that we play in shaping it. It raises important questions about our responsibilities to protect and preserve, and the nature of cultural identity itself, and also the consequences of dispossession. But perhaps these questions can also give rise to hope for future restoration and reconciliation. Our university is committed to advancing knowledge and understanding of the natural environment, and we are proud to be a leading institution in the study of biodiversity conservation as well as environmental, social and economic sustainability. As custodians of our island home, we are committed to giving voice to those who are otherwise silent or have been silenced. So this is why this talk is brought to you free of charge this evening as part of our Island of Ideas public talk series. Tonight, as with all, uh, all uh, events in our series, we invite you to take part in this important conversation. By doing so, you become part of a movement uh, that seeks to protect our planet and its inhabitants and leave a legacy that future generation, generations can value and be proud of. I'd like to begin tonight by just having a look at a few historic images. I, I commenced my studies at the University of Tasmania in 1980 and um, graduated with a science degree in, uh, in life sciences and geography. Um, now that eventually led me um, into, uh, into a PhD in art history. Um, 
and might sound like a big a big jump, but I consider art history to really be just human visual ecology. Um, and my particular research interest is in colonial representation of um, of Tasmanian Aboriginal people and culture and Aboriginal cultural landscapes. And it's colonial landscape painting um, that I find um, particularly important and I'm, I'm, um, I'm always in the business of, of promoting colonial landscape painting to my, um, to my colleagues in the, uh, in the life sciences um, because of its value in providing uh, a window or a lens into um, cultural landscapes of Tasmania um, at a time before the advent of photography. Um, many of you will be familiar with uh, the landscape painting of um, John Glover. John Glover is famous for, um, for his depiction of Aboriginal people uh, in the Tasmanian landscape. Uh, and in fact, he was, um, he was one of the first colonial artists uh, to include Aboriginal people in, in um, the landscapes of Van Diemen's Land after a period of nearly 30 years where Aboriginal people were specifically excluded from those, from those landscapes. Um, there was a visual terra nullius at play in, in Van Diemen's Land. Um, this image is, um, is of particular interest because it shows um, Aboriginal people um, um, doing a kangaroo dance and this involved um, men uh, displaying their, their prowess and their, um, uh, their strength by competing to jump um, as high into the air as possible. And, uh, and um, these dancers were, were capable of, um, of quite incredible um, athletic feats. Um, we don't have any images of, uh, of, king, of uh, emu dancers, um, uh, any visual images, but um, we do have written accounts of, of Aboriginal people portraying emus, as well as horses and, uh, and bullocks. Um, uh, the appearance of, uh, of Europeans uh, also very quickly influenced uh, cultural performance. Um, the other really important thing to consider when we're thinking about um, the so-called natural environment of Tasmania uh, is how strongly influenced it was by Aboriginal cultural practices. Um, the vast majority of of the Tasmanian landscape is in fact a cultural landscape. It's either been actively um, influenced and managed by the use of Aboriginal burning, um, or it has been allowed to develop into the state that it's in um, because it's, it's been buffered um, from, uh, from fire by burning of surrounding landscapes. I'm thinking of fire sensitive alpine uh, vegetation in, in that respect. Um, this man, Manalagena, uh, was depicted in 1835. Uh, he's uh, one of my ancestors and, and an ancestor of many Aboriginal people in Tasmania today. Uh, importantly for this conversation, he can be seen here holding a fire stick. Um, Aboriginal people carried fire sticks with them um, most of the time, not um, as some early anthropologists speculated because they didn't know how to, to light fire, to make fire, but simply because this is this is a convenient way of being able to light a fire quickly. It's an exact analogue of, of the way people carry lighters around in their pockets today. Uh, this, is, um, this is a painting from late in the, in the 19th century by Tasmania's first uh, European-born landscape painter, um, William Piggany. And um, for those of you who have done a bit of walking in this part of Tasmania, you'll, you'll find this, um, uh, this picture quite familiar. Um, in particular, uh, there's a hill there in the, uh, in the mid foreground, uh, which is often colloquially referred to as a half woody hill, as one of those um, near Melaleuca in the southwest of, of Tasmania. And this is a direct indication of, of regular burning, um, the occurrence of, of fire, um, and, and uh, the in influence of vegetation you can see in the, in the fire shadow on that hill. Uh, where fires don't burn because it's, um, it's either south or southerly um, facing aspect. Um, and out into that, uh, that plain there, if you've ever walked um, through one of those plains, you'll know um, not only that they can be quite boggy, um, um, but they are characterised by copses of, uh, of often tea tree. Um, 
Now, these, um, these valleys are often um, uh, the home of uh, large growths of, um, of gymnosheenus or, or button grass. And these button grass plains have changed quite considerably over the last couple of hundred years. And the change has mainly been due to the cessation of regular Aboriginal burning. Now, one of, one of the consequences of that, that change in, that, in the fire regime um, is that we, we are starting to see um, um, reductions in the populations of certain species that have a very close relationship with, with button grass. And the orange-bellied parrot is one of the best examples. Uh, the orange-bellied parrot, there are many reasons why this bird is very rare. One of the reasons is that it, it um, particularly likes button grass of a certain age and it's not very partial to over-mature button grass. So if button grass isn't being burned uh, more frequently than, um, than every 10 years or so, then it's, uh, it becomes less, uh, less supportive of, of, um, of parrot uh, population. So if that's the case, if the, the, the change in land management from Aboriginal cultural burning through to our, our current diversity of land management practices on the island, ranging from um, clear felling and deforestation um, right through to, um, uh, to protection uh, and attempts to exclude fire. We, t we tend to want to do that in our World Heritage Areas and National Parks, despite the fact that these are areas that have been burnt regularly over thousands of years. Um, we should expect that there will be consequences for, for a great variety of plants and animals and um, uh, we'll hear more about the, um, uh, the influence of, of the last couple of hundred years on, on the thylacine and the emu. Um, Joseph Lysett um, produced a number of uh, views of, of Van Diemen's land um, that were published in London in 1824. And you can see from these views um, uh, the, uh, the, the grasslands and the, uh, the, the mosaic of grasslands and, and woodlands and open woodlands that existed in the Derwent Valley and the Midlands and the Esk Valley uh, at the time of, of British arrival. Um, these were areas that were uh, appropriated um, for grazing. Uh, they, they were recognised as favourable grazing landscape by the British um, primarily because they were created as a grazing landscape by Aboriginal people for kangaroos. Um, so um, kangaroos were effectively replaced by, by, uh, by sheep and, and cattle. Um, we also have some very early images of, um, of the two animals in question tonight. This is a rather curious um, drawing of a thylacine by the colonial artist John Lewin, who also produced a number of landscape uh, views of Tasmania. And um, if you can look, look beyond or if you can overlook the, um, uh, the strange effort at, at the, uh, the thylacine, you, you can see uh, a landscape which is most likely uh, the Ben Lomond Range. And, um, and it shows the open woodlands uh, of the, um, the surrounding foothills. Uh, these are environments that were, that were, um, that the th both the thylacine, kangaroo and the emu were all adapted to. Um, but are, are becoming much rarer in, in Tasmania today. Um, one of the reasons this side I've seen looks so odd is um, it, wasn't, it wasn't drawn from life. Um, this particular one uh, was uh, the, the watercolour was made in Sydney from a specimen that was shot by Colonel um, Patterson and sent, uh, ultimately sent back to London uh, for the benefit of Joseph Banks. Um, images of emus are even more confusing. Um, this is uh, an engraving based on a, a watercolour by uh, a French artist, um, Charles Alexandre Lassure, who travelled with uh, uh, Nicolas Baudin on his, uh, his expedition that brought him to Van Diemen's Land in uh, 1803. Um, the, uh, the painting is titled um, uh, a um, uh, a cassowary, cassowary um, of Ile de Cré, which, which is the, was the French name for Kangaroo Island, although there is some discussion, energetic discussion, about whether this is actually uh, an image of the, um, the King Island uh, subspecies or the Kangaroo Island subspecies, and Tristan will talk more about this as, 
as, as we go on. Um, another slightly later image. Um, this was uh, published in uh, the, uh, the volume Birds of Australia, um, alongside of similar images of um, uh, emus identified as King Island em emus, Kangaroo Island emus and Tasmanian emus. Um, however, again, uh, the drawing is based, uh, in this case, on a skin that was held by the British Museum. Um, and I think uh, in this case, um, the artist has done a, um, a magnificent job of, of reimagining a live bird um, from, what, from what he had to work with. If I was to be asked as an art historian and a lapsed biologist, um, what's, what sort of image we might look to for, to, to give us perhaps the, the best um, approximation of a documentary image, and I'd go to this work by William Kay. Um, it was painted around 1840. Um, whether or not Kay um, was able to see um, emus uh, in the flesh, live birds, I'm not sure. Um, but it's, um, uh, Tristan might be able to inform us as to the likelihood of that. Um, but he certainly would have had access to, to people who, um, who uh, were seeing birds on a, on a, these birds on a day-to-day -day basis. The other important thing is that gives us a sense of the scale, um, the size of the Tasmanian emu. We've got a sense of scale with those birds standing next to sheep. And um, uh, again, Tristan will say something more about, about uh, some of the mythology uh, that, has, um, that has grown up around the Tasmanian emu um, and the idea that it was so radically different to the emus that we're more familiar with from mainland Australia. Um, being being um, such a small bird. And of course, the, the mythologies that have grown up around both the emu and the thylacine um, have spun off into all sorts of strange and fanciful and romanticised ideas about, about these animals. Um, and I, I particularly, um, particularly love this image, uh, which was titled Emu and Wolves, um, where we have this, um, uh, this recreated, imagined, um, image of, uh, of a, a Tasmanian emu um, trying to escape the clutches of, um, of a, a pack of thylacines, whether or not that, that scene was ever, uh, ever witnessed in, uh, in life. Uh, again, we might, uh, we might hear more on that from, from our speakers tonight. So that brings me to um, our speakers tonight. And I would simply ask you to join me in welcoming to the stage, ecologist and conservation biologist, Professor Barry Brook. So I'm going to very briefly set the scene ecologically for the thylacine um, to help um, give us a context for the discussion um, this evening. So as Greg mentioned, it, it was an Australian species. It had evolved on the continent of Australia as it drifted northwards in uh, over the last um, 65 million years since the end of the dinosaurs. And we have fossil evidence of it going back for many millions of years in Northern Australia. And indeed there's even rock art of thylacines up at Ubia in the Northern Territory. So it once lived everywhere in Australia, uh, but it seemed to have vanished quite suddenly from the mainland about three and a half thousand years ago, maybe 4,000 years ago, along with the devil, which was also a uh, a pan-Australian animal. But they both persisted in Tasmania through to modern times. There's debate about what caused them to go extinct on the mainland. Uh, it was coincidental with the arrival of an Indian pack dog called the dingo in northern Australia around that same time. And so they started to work with Aboriginal people to provide an effective hunting companion, but also became a wild animal themselves. And so it could well be that competition caused that mainland extinction. But dingo never arrived on Tasmania. It had already been isolated at the end of the last ice age by 14,000 years ago or so. It was completely cut off from mainland Australia and the devils and the thylacines were secure on the island. Secure at least until European colonisation starting in the very early 19th century. Thylacines looked like a wolf and they were considered 
by the European settlers who were mostly interested as they spread through the island with grazing sheep. They were considered wolf-like and likely to have the same habitats. So they, along with other predators like the wedge-tailed eagle, were persecuted as a consequence. And so the most productive land for thylacines in Tasmania around the Midlands and East Coast, they were quickly wiped out. However, the population persisted in the northwest and the west of the state um, up until the 20th century. Around 18, the late 1880s, there was a bounty put on the thylacine where a pound was paid for every skin that was handed in. And this was an encouragement to continue to eradicate them in areas where they were considered a pest. By 1910, the bounty system had ceased because there were so few thylacines suddenly being handed in. Uh, but they were occasionally uh, seen and captured or shot. The last known live thylacine in the wild was, um, was shot in 1930 at Morbana um, in northwest Tasmania. And around the same time, maybe a couple of years later, the last specimen was captured in the wild and taken to the Hobart Zoo, and that was the one that died in 1936. However, following the death of the last captive specimen, there were many sightings that continued for decades afterwards, indeed even through to the present. And so it, there was a considerable debate as to whether the species continued to persist in wild areas. It was never resolved. There was never clear, um, unequivocal proof that it was out there, like a body or a photograph. There was simply hearsay. Often people who had known the animal in the wild when um, it was still um, known to be present or they'd hunted it back in the early 20th century, there was a famous sighting in 1982 by a parks ranger up in the northwest near Tagari, um, which launched a national parks search for three years for the thylacine, but they never found any proof of it. So there is speculation as to when exactly it went extinct. As a biologist, I could say my best estimate is after 1936 and probably somewhere between the late 1950s and the mid-1980s. So it's gone. It's extinct as far as we're aware. Uh, but the debate that now has arisen, and it, it's like Jurassic Park coming real, is can we take the DNA of an extinct organism and recreate it using modern technology? This debate isn't restricted to the thylacine. It's just one of those iconic species. There have uh, also been um, serious discussion about bringing back mammoth, passenger pigeons, these icons of extinction, and even recently the dodo. So we have museum specimens. In the case of the thylacine, we have some juvenile thylacines preserved in alcohol so that the DNA was intact. So we have, using modern technology, the ability to read off this information and, at least in theory, completely reconstruct the genome of this creature. And then using the techniques that have been developed for cloning animals, there is, at least in theory, uh, a chance that we can bring back a thylacine. It's a marsupial, remember, it's not a placental, so it could in fact be done with a creature like a dunnart, which is tiny, it's almost like a mouse, but thylacine babies when they're born are the size of a rice grain, and so that doesn't actually matter that much if you had an artificial pouch and were able to raise them in captivity. So the idea behind what we're going to debate today is if we accept that this technology could produce a live thylacine or many live thylacines, uh, is that the right thing to do? Ecologically, would it work? Uh, technologically, I suppose, is it feasible? These are the kind of things we want to explore. Um, and as an ecologist, I'm interested in the question of if we were to recreate the thylacine into something that looked much and acted much like that original wild animal, how would it fit into the ecology of the island? There's still much of wild Tasmania that contains a rich diversity of, of um, mammals including predators like the devil and the quolls. The thylacine was a top predator. It was the kingpin of the vertebrate terrestrial community. Have we waited too long to bring it back? Would it just slot back in? Um, would, we, would they even be naive or would they be savvy enough to be able to adapt to those new environments? They're, they're speculative questions, but they're also potentially ecologically important questions that we can answer through scientific methods. And so it might be interesting in the debate to explore how ecologically we would go about reintroducing a species that's been absent from the landscape between somewhere between 80 and 50 years, which seems like a long while. It's a big gap, but if you think that 
occupied this landscape, much of it relatively unchanged over centuries. They've occupied that for 20,000 to a million years. Perhaps it's not such a stretch. But there's a diversity of opinions on this. Uh, we also have a similar debate going on regarding the Tasmanian emu, which also went extinct a little earlier than the thylacine, and so I'll hand over to Tristan now to continue that story. Well, thank you very much, Barry, and uh, thank you very much, Greg, for the welcome. Uh, well, de-extinction is certainly one of the most uh, spectacular ideas in conservation at the moment, but another idea that's similarly spectacular is uh, rewilding. In North America, conservationists are working toward protecting biodiversity at a huge scale. The Yukon to Yellowstone initiative proposes a 3,500 kilometer arc of habitat to be protected for animals like bears and wolves. <clears throat> and the Western Rewilding Initiative, the Western Rewilding Network proposes half a million kilometers of continuous wolf and beaver habitat. In Europe, conservationists are reintroducing and protecting bison, wild cattle and horses, bears, beavers, vultures, lynx, and wolves, all under the banner of rewilding. But rewilding doesn't have to be quite so spectacular and grandiose. And I'd like to introduce something a little more modest, a bit, more, a bit closer to home, and that's that we might have emus back in Tasmanian ecosystems if we wanted them. When the Bass Strait formed about 14,000 years ago, emus and people were isolated here together. As the seas rose, Kangaroo Island and King Island were formed as well, and the Kangaroo Island and King Island emus dwarfed very quickly. So by the time colonists arrived, they were some two-thirds the size of a mainland Australian emu. But there's actually very little evidence that Tasmanian emus were any different in size from mainland Australian emus. Just 30 years after the British settled here in the banks of the Derwent River and dug in, uh, emus were very rare in Tasmania. And then by the 1870s, they were all but gone and almost forgotten. Though, as Greg mentioned, not everybody forgot about the emus. And Aboriginal people in Tasmania still do emu dances today. No one until recently had formally investigated the reason for the emu's extinction, or where they lived. So a group of researchers here at UTAS, myself, Barry included, and Western Sydney University, decided to investigate. To find out where emus lived, we trawled through letters, documents, reports from colonists to find claims of an emu sighting. And then we predicted the probability of occurrence of emus based on topography and climate and uh, vegetation. And what we found was that emus lived throughout most of eastern Tasmania in all vegetation types, from grasslands to wet eucalyptus forest. They were not, as was previously assumed, a grassland specialist. We also wanted to find out how they went extinct, so we built quite a different kind of model, one that simulated emu population through time, and then we applied hunting pressure. We repeated this experiment thousands of times to see what emu populations would do with the kind of pressure that was applied by colonists. And what we found out is that if you hunt more than a couple of thousand emus every year, then you'll drive the population into the ground. There are some very rough estimates of the rate at which settlers, colonists in Tasmania were hunting emus. And it seems like within a couple of decades, they were indeed hunting them at a couple of thousand or more emus every year. They hunted emus with specially, and kangaroos, with specially bred dogs. Uh, and that's been very vividly portrayed in uh, James Boyce's book, Van Diemen's Land. We also looked at what habitat might be left for Tasmanian emus today. And we cross-checked that against land uses in Tasmania today. We ruled out areas that they might run into strife irrigated agriculture, for example. And we focused our efforts on areas where they might be protected, areas that are already protected, for example, when native vegetation or animals are protected. And as it turns out, there are large parts of Tasmania where emus could be released into open landscapes. 
Now, in terms of the biology and ecology of emus, it would be quite straightforward to reintroduce them. You could bring fertilized eggs from the mainland of, of Australia. You could hatch them here into large enclosures, basically big paddocks with plenty of native vegetation, and then study them very closely to see what kind of interactions they had with local uh, animals and plants, see what kind of effects they might have, and to see whether they thrive here. And then we could decide if we wanted them in our open landscapes. But why would we want to reintroduce emus into Tasmania? After all, they haven't been here for 150 years. I think there are several reasons to consider, but I'll just address one tonight. As an ecologist, I see that there's a good chance that emus are ecologically important. Sadly, we don't know very much about emus and their ecology. There simply hasn't been very much research done on them. But we do know that for large animals in general, they're often very important in ecosystems. Large animals will push through and push over vegetation. They'll eat herbivores at least, will eat a wide variety of plants. They'll scratch up the ground. They dis uh, disperse nutrients across the landscape at continental scales. And as for emus, we know that they're fantastic seed dispersers. An emu scat is like a couple of handfuls of wet compost filled with seeds. And that might be important for restoring landscapes, for example, after a fire. It might also be important for plant populations which need to disperse and move across the landscape in response to climate change. Now, an introduction of this, like this, where you're introducing a large animal to help you do restorative work in ecosystems is a hallmark of rewilding. And as I mentioned, rewilding has inspired conservationists elsewhere but maybe it's not the right fit for Australia. In the United States, it's come to mean restoring huge wilderness areas, big enough for large carnivores to roam and do their work, and ecological engineers like beavers. In Europe, rewilding has been influenced by the idea of large herbivores uh, creating open landscapes where there would otherwise be forest in prehistoric landscapes. Now, there are two themes that run through rewilding that I think are pertinent to our discussion this evening. And the first one is the concept of recreating wilderness. Now, Tasmania has gotten a lot of mileage out of the wilderness ideal. That wilderness concept has allowed us to protect ecosystems that would otherwise be exploited and damaged. But at the same time, that concept has its limits. That, uh, there's a whole history to how wilderness has been constructed as a concept and a series of hefty criticisms have been aimed at it over the last couple of decades. One problem is that if you make the Tasmanian wilderness or any other wilderness out to be a place without people, without culture, then you're denying, to that degree, denying the influence and the heritage and the care of Aboriginal people in that place. Indeed, many national parks around the world have been created exactly by removing and excluding Indigenous people. And those people have every right to be frustrated with conservationists for continuing to push that wilderness ideal. But does that mean that the concepts of wilderness and wildness and rewilding have nothing for us here in Australia? I'm not quite so sure that it is. I think rewilding is a plural concept. And I think it still has something to teach us. I mentioned a second aspect of rewilding that we might reflect on for a moment. Rewilding often focuses on the creative agency of animals in the landscape. In Europe, that's meant animal reintroductions, with the hope that beavers and bison, wolves and lynx will have a creative influence on ecosystems, that they'll revitalise, rejuvenate and reanimate them. In a sense, those introduced animals have become collaborators in creative projects. I think that's an interesting way to frame rewilding. I think it's an interesting way to frame our reintroduction of emus or thylacines to Tasmania as a creative endeavour with those animals. So I'd like to leave you with a couple of questions to ponder. The way in which we frame our conservation project says something about us, it says something about who we are. So what would it say about us 
if we framed these kind of reintroduction project as collaborative and creative? And what would it take to be good creatives and good collaborators? Thank you very much. Hello, um, my name's Hannah Stark and I'm not a scientist. I'm here as a critical and cultural theorist and I'm um, coming here to raise ethical questions about de-extinction from the perspective of the humanities. Um, so I'm interested in extinction because I believe it's definitional of our time, a period we're now calling the Anthropocene. This is an era in which human impact is shaping the planet in lasting ways. At the moment, I'm interested in natural history collections in the Anthropocene and the new meanings that they accrue in relation to environmental change, particularly when that change is caused by humans. I do work on extinction in relation to what Anne Chekovich describes as an archive of feelings. I want to think about the collective emotions that gather around extinction when we encounter it. And I want to think about what those emotions do. In the introduction to Loss, the Politics of Mourning, David Eng and David Kazanistan write that, as soon as the question what is lost is posed, it invariably slips into the question what remains. That is, loss is inseparable from what remains, for what is lost is known only by what remains of it, by how these remains are produced, read and sustained. To engage with extinction in relation to loss, I've been looking at the remains of extinct animals in museum collections around the world and thinking about how public environmental sentiment is shaped by these collections. So today we're talking about de-extinction and I want to show you some images of the remains of a thylacine that's been caught up in this project. So this is thylacine specimen P762. It's a pouch young and it is the one that was preserved in alcohol um, that Barry mentioned. P762 was about six months old at the time of her death. We know her exchange value in 1866 because of a letter written by the entomologist and naturalist George Masters to the Australian Museum about the trade he had negotiated for the institution of a large container of black fish and a young thylacine in spirit from the Tasmanian Museum for bird shells and another small box containing 2,893 insects. So this pup who died 70 years prior to the extinction of her species has been suspended in alcohol in a museum collection for over 150 years. This is an x-ray image of P762 and these images that I'm showing you of P762 are kept on the International Thylacine Specimen Database which is a remarkable database of all of the thylacine museum specimens in the world. And this last image I think is really interesting. So this is a display at the Australian Museum in their 200 Treasures exhibition. This is a replica of P762. It's made by Optofab, Optofab at Macquarie University and it's a 3D print based on a University of Melbourne 3D scan of the specimen. So in coming face to face with the remains of extinct animals, we're called to ask different questions about extinction and de-extinction. In considering the remains of rare condors, Carrie Wolf asks, what shall we do with these remains that are delivered over to us? What will we make of them and what will that make of us? These are questions that resonate with me when I look at P762 and other thylacine remains in museum collections. P762's DNA was harvested in the Australian Museum's resurrection project, which began around the millennium. This was ultimately unsuccessful because the DNA samples were contaminated by human DNA. And this project was discontinued in 2005. At the University of Melbourne, Andrew Pask heads up Tiger Lab. In their 2017 article in Nature, his, his team details how they successfully sequenced the thylacine genome from DNA extracted from a preserved thylacine pouch young from the museum Victoria collection. It's not the thylacine pictured. This was one displayed in their museum. Tiger Lab has partnered with Colossal Laboratories and Biosciences to deliver the most recent and highly publicised example of de-extinction science. 
So Colossal is a private company. It's funded through venture capitalism and high profile celebrity investors such as Paris Hilton and the Hemsworth brothers. It's based out of Texas and Colossal is also attempting to resurrect other charismatic extinct creatures, including the woolly mammoth and recently the dodo. While we're still some way from resurrecting a thylacine, the injection of funding from Colossal means that PASC now believes that in 10 years time, we could have our first living baby thylacine. The scientific discoveries and new technologies developed through de-extinction work can also be used in conservation ethics for other threatened marsupials. And marsupial conservation is particularly pertinent in Australia, which has the worst mammal extinction rate in the world. As we've heard today, there may also be other environmental benefits to de-extincting animals. However, we need to pause and think about what we owe these remains and to think critically and ethically about de-extinction. De-extinction is often rationalised through a problematic logic. Colossal Lab justifies their project through evoking human exceptionalism by which humans have a duty to the planet and, they say, are custodians and defenders of the nature which sustains life. Colossal also naturalises its work through reframing de-extinction as part of natural processes rather than an intervention into nature. For example, they assert on their website that many companies claim they're going to change the world. At Colossal, we believe the world doesn't need to be changed. The world needs to be healed. They agree that the extinction of the thylacine is anthropogenic or human caused. And because we have caused this, we also have the responsibility um, to reverse a problem that humans have created. De-extinction science itself is part of a species logic in which ha the harvesting of genetic material in the service of resurrection erases the individual animal's life, death and afterlife. The animal becomes genetic material. The existence of frozen arcs or collections of genetic material has, according to Matthew Trulu, led to an abstraction of animals to genetic data in which we see a prioritisation of species over individual, code over life, genes over bodies. We have to remember that it is the belief in human exceptionalism that has brought us to the Anthropocene and which is evoked in calls to undo human environmental impact through human stewardship. This double logic is exemplified in a statement made by Pask when asked if he was concerned that de-extinction was playing God. He remarked, when people say we are playing God, I say we do it all the time. We certainly played God when we exterminated the thylacine. For Pask, anthropogenic extinction and the scientific pursuit of de-extinction are two sides of the same coin. So if the human is both the problem and the solution, how do we maintain responsibility for past actions and inactions while searching for solutions to Anthropocene futures? De-extinction is also justified through asserting that it, will that it will erase the impacts of colonialism. While the thylacine provides a particular example of an extinction which was enacted through human violence to another species and through bureaucratic and government mismanagement of endemic wildlife, the thylacine also speaks to the effects of Western imperial expansion, particularly in the Antipodes. The thylacine was extinct within 133 years of European invasion. This attitude is exemplified in Mike Archer's remark that the de-extinction of the thylacine could redeem humans because it would, he says, reverse one of the great blots of the history of the colonisation of Australia. So de-extinction mobilises a logic of redemption through which we could undo or erase human environmental impact. But when we undo ex extinction, what do we erase? What do we forget? Are we absolved? And what do we owe these remains delivered over to us? What will we make of them? And what will that make of us? Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, Tristan and Barry. Um, the word debate was mentioned earlier on and um, I can easily imagine us, us now stepping into a, a traditional debating format to, uh, 
to pick up on some of these ideas. Um, unfortunately, we won't be doing that and we don't have time to do that tonight, but you know, perhaps that's a, that's a future session, a future event that we might, that we might consider because I, I for one, would, would love to sit in on that. Um, but what's been made very clear, I think, is that we have a complex um, um, constellation of, of ecological, um, biochemical, scientific, ethical and moral um, uh, values that we need, that we need to, to hold together in um, considering decisions that we make as, as we move forward. I would um, like to just remind people um, who are watching online that now is your time to get involved and um, enter questions into the Q&A function. Um, and uh, what I'll do is um, I'll address uh, as many of those questions to the panel as, as we can get through this evening. For those of you who are in the room, um, I'd ask you if you have a question to raise your hands and uh, hand and wait for, um, for the microphone. Uh, we will start with a, an online question and then go to, um, uh, to the first question from the, from the audience. Uh, the first online question um, uh, is from Harko Verkman. Um, and it's quite a technical question. I won't read the whole thing out, but basically Harko is, is, um, is saying that, assuming that, that a full and functional genome can be reconstructed, um, how, do we in, how do we ensure that this is a, uh, a functional um, uh, population? Now, he's, he's referring to the, the need for, um, for a viable population to have um, sufficient diversity of MHC alleles, um, that is, um, uh, functional units within the immune system that allow um, an individual and a population to deal with with foreign antigens, with infectious diseases, which can rapidly threaten uh, it, um, uh, inbred populations. So the question is, how could an how could an adequate representation of these MHC alleles be identified for introduction into uh, uh, the creation of a sustainable population. Kristen or Barry, I'm you so like happy to... you're answering this, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> so the concept of a viable population is to have enough genetic diversity to maintain reproductive fitness. And as the question mentioned, one of those is in the ability to withstand disease or other environmental stresses. Um, and Conservation biology has generally concluded that you need somewhere between 500 to 5,000 individuals um, of a large vertebrate to have a viable population. Does, so does that mean this is dead in the water to begin with? Well, not necessarily. Uh, the technology that would enable uh, the resurrection of the thylacine would also enable essentially ad lib uh, interventions in terms of modifying the genetic code. So. It, as long as you could understand how that diversity is generated in related marsupials and ideally look at a number of specimens that have these levels of diversity, you could, in theory, regenerate it. And, and that's what's being proposed. The second part of the question I would respond to is it wouldn't be done in an instantaneous way. So there would be very much a staged approach to this. So let's say you recreated a thylacine you might study it and understand how to raise it in captivity. And then you might recreate a small number and raise them in a reserve. And then at, if that worked, you might then introduce further individuals to say a, a reserved area like, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but something like the Tasman Peninsula or Morar Island, like we did with Devil. So a, a restricted population that could be studied in wild conditions. And it would be many decades, I suspect, until you would take that next step and try and introduce a viable population on the mainland. So we're talking decades of further research on how to improve this technology. I don't see it as a major barrier. It's just one of those things that will have to be dealt with in stages. Um, we'll go to a question from the audience. Thank you. Yes, my question also had to do with viable population and looking at the time frame that, that you've established for, for getting a, a hopefully viable population of Tasmanian devils up. And given the time frame for uh, increasing global warming, 
I just I wonder if you've given much thought to how the money for what appears to be a vast project might might be better used uh, in face of uh, our extinction crisis. Um, I think that's one of the most common criticisms levelled at de-extinction research that the money could be better used in conservation ethics for uh, sorry in conservation projects for for other species that are not yet extinct. Um, I guess it assumes a lot of things about how money circulates. It assumes that the money that um, governments and private organisations and universities have for de-extinction would go into some kind of conservation project rather than into something like, I don't know, weapons production. Who knows where the money might go? Um, but I do think that is the major and probably one of the most convincing criticisms of, of this science. Yeah, just to add to that, I don't find it a convincing criticism because Paris Hilton and the Hemsworth brothers wouldn't be investing in the logical preservation of 50 small brown bird species. I mean, as conservation biologists, we see the value in that biodiversity, but that, that money is not fungible. So it might not go into conservation science, it might go into some other technology, it might go into sending them on a rocket ship around the moon or colonising Mars, you know. There are various sexy ventures that that money could go into, but to make the argument that it would then be invested in some incremental, infinitesimally incremental change in how we address climate change, I think is not persuasive. We'll go to, um, to an, another question that came in quite early on um, from an anonymous uh, questioner. The, the photo of the farmer with the dog and thylacine suggests some domestication. Um, if true, is this a factor to consider in reintroduction? Um, I think we've had, we've had some, some outbreaks of, um, um, of public discussion over the last few decades of um, promoting, there was a guy, was he director of South Australian Museum? Uh, director of Australian Museum Australian said that Museum. we could have them as domestic pets, yeah. that that would be the, the future of the thylacine. So Hannah, perhaps you might might like to continue on and offer any, any I mean, thoughts I guess it, it, it is about if this animal is um, de-extincted, how will its, its life be regulated um, and how will it be protected? So the idea that, that thylacines would go into um, reserves on the Tasman Peninsula is a, is a lovely idea. And one of the questions I was going to ask is, is if you have thoughts on where thylacines might be rewilded. Um, but there's also concerns about whether they would go into zoos or, um, you know, what kind of future and what kinds of lives they might have if rewilding wasn't the future that they found themselves with. Yeah, that uh, specimen I showed that had been shot, that was... Um, raiding um, Will Batty's uh, chicken coop at the time. It was a wild animal. It was one of the last individuals living in that part of the Northwest trying to survive. And of course, the attitudes of the time were, um, well, that's a pest, we'll kill it. So looking deeper in time, there is actually no evidence that Aboriginal people domesticated thylacine. They're not a dog. They might look like a dog, but they're a marsupial. They're much more closely related to a kangaroo than they are to a dog. It's entirely superficial and there's no evidence that they were ever domesticated or suitable for domestication. And indeed, it's a great danger in reintroductions to have overly domesticated animals in captive situations. You get this adaptation to captivity that makes them very poorly suited to being reintroduced in the wild. So one would have to be very careful if recreating the species was to not domesticate it and to try and um, reintroduce it into natural environments in a way that maintained its wildness. Uh, thank you, Barry. We'll um, we'll go to another another online question, which is um, I think related to this in some way. Um, so, if the recreated population turns out to not be viable, do we then make them extinct again? What are the ethics of that? <laughs> Any comment, Hannah? I guess this goes um, goes repeat, to this. Yeah, we yeah. just repeat the same mistakes. Um, I'd be interested, um, Tristan, to hear more about the emu on some of these questions and plans for rewilding that where that would end up, and in in Tasmania, where if there's land scoped out already for it to go into, and what will happen if that project's not successful? Yeah, look, I think the nice thing about an emu rewilding is it's not urgent, uh, and, and that's you know that's something of a relief for conservation. Um, sure, ecological restoration is urgent, but this particular aspect of it is not. So it's really the kind of thing where we could take our time and move slowly 
and bring the community on board and kind of make a community decision, I suppose. As I mentioned, you could start with uh, emus in enclosures first and then see if people were on board with having them in open landscapes. And if so, where? You know, Tasmania is not just one homogenous place. There are lots of different parts of it. So I think this is kind of something that we can take our time about and reflect on. And I think it's a really nice juxtaposition with the de-extinction of the thylacine where everybody seems to be in this enormous hurry to get it done in making crazy claims like we'll have thylacines in 10 years, which Mike Archer also said. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, look, that's, that's biotech, um, you know, hyperbole. But, uh, yeah, I guess it's the kind of thing that we could take our time and reflect on and do carefully and slowly. And Barry? There are also other examples of de-extinction of Australian predators that are going on right now or are proposed. One of them is the eastern quoll on the mainland, which was a marsupial predator that went extinct on mainland Australia and now there are moves to reintroduce Tasmanian quolls onto the mainland, partly through a captive breeding program. The second is the interesting idea about reintroducing Tasmanian devils and potentially paddy melons back onto the mainland, both of which went extinct there. So this is one where we can set aside the science of resurrecting a species and just say we have a species here that has been shown to be vulnerable to island effects. You know, one population, uh, catastrophic disease hitting it, it was under real threat. So uh, insurance population in a place that was its habitat until a few thousand years ago is an interesting problem. But that's been overwhelmed by political issues, including arguments about its Tasmanianness and whether it would lose that by reintroducing it, that it is illustrative of the socio-political problems that any venture like this is going to face. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? Um, yes, gentleman with the microphone. Uh, given that you're planning to, or that you would plan to introduce significant numbers of these rewilded animals, how would you cope with the introduced predators and their devastating effects on them? Uh, sorry, are you talking about predators affecting emus? Uh, cred predators uh, of, of any sort. Um, you know, dealing with, uh, I, I'm thinking of cats and dogs, those sort of things that are uh, wild in Tassie at the moment, well, which are uh, causing uh, uh, terrible destruction. As an ecologist, I can reassure you there are effectively no wild dogs in Tasmania. I've camera trapped uh, millions of camera trap nights and the only dogs I've ever found have collars on or have people walking behind them. Cats are an endemic problem throughout the state, but it's probably uh, an argument that thylacines would actually suppress cat numbers rather than be suppressed by them. The dingo is, for example, um, one of the most effective ways to suppress cat populations on the mainland. And so apart from a cat may be raiding um, a den of juvenile thylacines, it would seem to be a limited problem. So we haven't got foxes here, we haven't got dingoes, and so two of the potential major impactors that you might think could affect thylacines aren't on Tasmania and wouldn't be a threat to it. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. I'll go to one more online question. Um, are any other endangered small mammals, marsupials, at risk if the thylacine is reintroduced? Has the rewilding of predators in other ecosystems mentioned by the speakers caused issues with other at-risk animal populations? Uh, yes, I mean, yes, there's a risk. I don't know how big the risk is. You'd ha just have to try it and see, I suppose. Uh, ecologists often fall back on the idea that, well, these species lived alongside one another for hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. So there's a certain trust that, they can, that they're able to do it again. But yeah, certainly there's a risk. Uh, we'll go to another uh, question from the audience. Um, uh, this is a bit left field. Uh, is there another dimension that needs to be brought into this? What is the community on about? Is there evidence of grieving? What are we grieving? What is it precisely we've lost? And how guilty we should feel about it? And secondly, what precisely would be the community goals in what we're trying to achieve? Are we trying to go for restoration? Are we trying to build a new world? Or what are we on about? I think there's a, there's a deep human dimension here that needs to be looked at. That we're looking at the particulars, and, the, uh, and I have scientific background really. We're looking at the particulars of what is possible and what is feasible. But I think there's a bigger, bigger picture that needs to be looked at.
Oh, thank you, Hannah. I think this is yeah, this is a good a good one for me. So, um, I am really interested in memorial culture and in how um, extinct animals are remembered and the feelings that we have for them after they're gone. Um, and one of the things that's quite interesting about the thylacine is the thylacine never disappears for us. It's it's all around us in Tasmania. It's on our beer labels. It's on buildings. There are murals of them everywhere. You can't go very far without seeing a thylacine. So I think there is something about its refusal to disappear in the cultural in the cultural sphere and the cultural imagination that suggests we haven't properly mourned the thylacine and we haven't properly thought through um, the implications of our actions on this species. And the same can be said for most extinct animals around the world, that if you look um, around the world at how animals are memorialised, it's mostly for war animals that we see monuments or markers or memorials um, acknowledging their loss and acknowledging their death. It's quite rare that we see that for extinct animals. So I think it's an excellent question. Well, th this is great because I have a question for you, Hannah. Uh, you said you've criticised the idea of de-extinction as redemption, as an act of redemption. But I'm wondering, is there room for de-extinction or rewilding or ecological restoration in this way to be an act of contrition, sort of a humble act uh, an act to say, okay, recognising that we have done something wrong, that we are responsible or the inheritors of responsibility and to do it in a, in a fairly positive and transformative way. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. And I think there are real differences between um, reintroducing um, species that are still living elsewhere into an environment that they once lived and um, de-extincting that animal using technology. They're, they're quite different things to, to talk about. But I absolutely think there are there are other ways we can, we can think about what it means um, ethically. Um, I just wonder if that is what we see in these um, sort of biotech companies and the way that they get funding for this and the way that they support research. So I, I think the sort of rhetoric that they use around the work that they're doing um, is very much about uh, the place of the human and redemption of the human. It would be wonderful if it was more thoughtful and, and more um, contrite. So we did manage to go a little way towards some debate. Um, hopefully that'll that'll wet it, wet our appetites for um, for more discussion of this um, this really quite fascinating and challenging issue. It's it's more than science. It's more than than um, than opportunity. It's also about about intentionality and and responsibility. Um, as I mentioned before, it's it it causes causes us to think about our custodial relationship with country and the um, the potential for our actions to shape in an intentional way the place that we call that we call our home um, I would like to invite you all to um, join me in uh, thanking our experts tonight Professor Barry Brook uh, Tristan Durham and associate professor Hannah Stark Uh, this evening's talk will be available soon as a video and podcast via the, via the Island of Ideas website, uh, which is now on your screen, or will be. Um, for the latest information on our upcoming events, um, please check the Island of Ideas uh, webpage um, and subscribe to receive uh, email updates. We hope to see you at our next event, um, and uh, that next event um, is called What Hope for Humanity. So check our website to, uh, to register for that. Um, you can attend this online or in person at our Cradle Coast campus in Burnie at West Park on the 30th of March. Um, you can register and find out uh, more details uh, by going to the link on the screen. Um, by engaging in this discussion and sharing these ideas with your friends and families, you work with us to make positive change positive, considered and critical change um, in, our, um, in our local and global landscape. So thank you all very much uh, online and in person here tonight. Um, and thank you again to our panellists uh, for taking part in tonight's special event.
on behalf of the University of Tasmania and my fellow speakers, um, have a happy and safe evening. Thank you and good night.